Hello, and welcome to the CFA Society San Francisco podcast, where we interview and discuss current topics with leading members of the Bay Area investment community. This week, Tanya Subatang, Membership Manager with CFA Society San Francisco, sits down with Stephen Perkins, CFA, Founder and Portfolio Manager at Toronado Capital Management. Listen in as they discuss entrepreneurship, venture capital, interviewing and talent acquisition, and career growth. Good morning, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Things are good. Good. So I'm super excited about our conversation today. I know we have a lot to talk about. And usually one of the first questions that I ask everybody is how do they get into the industry? And, you know, having done this, this is our second season. I've gotten a lot of different answers. So I'm curious about your starting because you actually receive a BA in economics at UC Berkeley and you had studied some time at the London School of Economics and Political Science. So did you always know you wanted to have a career in finance and investment? Uh, sort of, sort of. I, I I grew up in a an area in Los Angeles in which most everybody was an engineer. Mm. I worked for a defense contractor, worked for the airport, things like that. And so I liked history. I liked poli sci. I liked econ. I liked the idea of the markets. Uh, but I started out studying industrial engineering uh, wow. at Cal and got, was introduced to a bunch of game theory classes uh, were, that were way more fun than memorizing periodic tables for chemistry classes and transferred into into the econ department to pursue that a bit more. And I was fortunate I had some exposure through the CFA, actually. My aunt was a CFA charter holder and a volunteer for the New York Society. So so seeing her and going on field trips to go see what the financial markets looked and felt like in in New York uh, certainly whet the appetite as well. Wow. So you can credit your aunt to kind of introducing you to this <laughs> to this world. She was a fixed income utilities analyst. Uh, so not the most exciting of sectors to cover. It definitely pushed me towards equities as those things go. So speaking of your career, you know, most of your career has been in venture capital profession, which can be difficult to get into. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure that it's been mainly venture capital. So I started my career at Robertson Stevens doing sell side research straight out of college. And that was awesome. Like uh, some of my best professional friends are still people who I worked with in uh, 96, 97, 98. And I had the opportunity to move into venture capital in 98 and chose to stay within Robertson Stevens to do that. And I had the same roommates who were still doing equity research. I uh, and was a venture capitalist 98, 99, 2000 and found that I got worse and worse at it over time. Yeah, really? My 98 deals all worked and the 99 they were only mixed and 2000, none of them worked. Uh, maybe that had more to do with the market than with me, mm-hmm. but I was shorting tech stocks in my personal account while doing venture capital thing and realized I wanted to go and spend time in public markets as well. So I ended up spending quite a bit of my career at Crosslink and Crosslink is best known for being a venture capital firm. But my second uh, tour of duty there from 2005 through starting Tornado, I spent probably 75, 80% of my time on the public market side of the business and much less on the venture capital side. So I, I feel like I'm venture fluent, but uh, like Toronado, I, it, we focus on the public market. So you don't think it's too hard to get into it? You think it's just a specific niche? That's no, I think venture to... I think venture okay. capital is a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, for me, as a 24-year-old doing that job, right? It mm-hmm. was, they had to sell me to get to my boss who would write a check. Mm-hmm. And understanding the humility of being that gatekeeper role was really valuable to me in learning about bunch of new industries and having some of the wisest, most experienced, most creative folks coming through your office to tell you about how they're going to go and disrupt the status quo. And geez, that's fun every day. Uh, The hard part is you say no 90, 95% of the time. We had physical in-person meetings Mm -hmm. with over 350 entrepreneurs. Oh, wow. We wrote nine checks. Oh, wow. So that wasn't like they sent us a business plan and we said, thanks, no thanks. That was like physical meeting. And we tried to invest in more than nine. Right. We, I think, extended 15 term sheets, but it's a ridiculously lopsided business in that sense. And so it's very valuable to understand like what matters to us. What are we looking for? 
pattern recognition helps you shortcut through the not wasting your time, but also not wasting the entrepreneur's time. Right. Uh, right. Since if this isn't going to be a fit, let's get that out of the way as early as we can. But to get into venture capital, I, I went through a kind of an odd process. I'm not sure it would even exist anymore. <laughs> so I'll share that one. So the Series 7 was required in order to get your name on the research report. And in 1997, I was involved in writing a research report on optical communication. So I covered, well, I was the junior guy covering DSL, if you remember that, (laughs) uh, and cable equipment and optics. Uh And we wrote a piece about uh, OC3 and OC12 ad drop multiplexers, really exciting stuff. And my name got on the bottom of that report and a venture capital firm said, we want to do more in optics and your name's at the bottom of the report. So you probably wrote this. Can we talk to you? (laughs) And that was my entree into venture capital at a very early age, having done some research, right? I was a year and a half out of college into a a space, but being numerate, conversational, and having a little bit more domain expertise than the next guy Mm -hmm. uh, was enough to get into that market. And then how would you do so now? Here in San Francisco, I think there's rarely a cocktail party in which somebody is not trying to raise money for some startup or has a friend who's doing a thing or whatever else. And it's fun to do that as a social activity. Mm -hmm. But if you want to think about that as a profession, like the same way that you wouldn't invest in public stocks based on, oh, my friends are doing that. Like, how do you build your own conviction, your own roadmap, your own goals behind doing this? Like, maybe you can't own 20% of the business like a venture capital firm would try to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you can still try to leverage informational advantages of like, well, I, I know that this category is going in that direction and these people are trying to participate in a thoughtful way and I'll put money behind those ideas. I was really curious that you said one of your favorite courses in college was game theory. And I'm sure there's a specific type kind of mindset or mind exercise that you you kind of train yourself to do. Does that kind of mentality apply to when you are analyzing a company in your role in venture capitalism? Because 350 and only nine is coming through. It, it, that's a pretty big difference. You know, what were some, you don't have to share the criteria you were looking for, but how do you choose somebody? What mental exercise do you have to do in order to distinguish, yes, this is a move forward, or is it slowly based on, you know, this follows the company's mission. This is the only thing we're going to stick with. So starting thematically is wildly valuable of where is a sector Where is a segment of the world? Where's an industry that a small company might have right to exist? Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of good markets out there where the big guys are big and have scale advantages for a reason, right? So trying to figure out where disruption might be happening. There's a a venture capitalist who said that Warren Buffett is kind of the anti-venture capitalist, right? He's betting that we're all going to wake up and eat McDonald's and drink Mm Coca-Cola and buy Geico insurance. And there's a truth to that of most of the time, disruption doesn't disrupt. Most of the time, Mm -hmm. disruption fails. And so finding categories, segments where you think that a small company might be able to break in and often that is they have a better product. But a better product is only a seat at the table. Like It buys you a window because the big companies are going to try to copy you. Right. New upstarts are going to try to copy you. And so is there some sort of business model advantage that you now can take hold of because you have that seat at the table? And Do you have a management team that understands that wrinkle, that crease to seize that opportunity uh, and monetize that difference? So at least what, what I find is that rarely is a better mousetrap a good 10-year investment. It's the better mousetrap gets that team access to a thing that then allows them to go and create some sort of difference. And often they're very, one we use internally, the rubric is Netflix, right? So Netflix Mm -hmm. was a billion dollar public company for a long, long time selling, shipping DVDs to your house. Right. right? And it was a regional business. So nobody wanted to wait three days for the DVD to come back. So they would build these warehouses in different geographies and you'd get the DVD a day or two after you ship the last one back. Mm-hmm. And in those days, <laughs> it, it was not a terribly phenomenal business, but it was a nice cash flowing quality business with a team that was looking for advantages to pivot out of. And so they, they spent what was for them a huge amount of money going and buying a library of content and offering it streaming, bought it from Lionsgate for less than $100 million. Whereas like today, 
yeah. some, of, some of the shows they're greenlighting on billions and billions of dollars of resources. So if you and I wanted to go start a streaming television service, we might need quite a bit of money to go to do so. Whereas back then there was the, there was an opportunity that arose thanks to some of those broad, broadband infrastructure investments uh, where we all were able to get a streamed video to our house and where the legacy content guys hadn't figured that out yet and were willing to sell the digital rights for reasonably small amounts of money. And they were able to build a rather large lead in a jaded way. Prevents a lot of upstarts from coming after them later, which should drive some economic value. And now they're a lot bigger than a billion dollars. But it's how to identify that early is let, let's not go and take pattern recognition too, too far and say, okay, we need to go find a DVD shipping company because okay. that, let's go find somebody who has an adjacent market they can go and glob on to. So. I think that is a great story and kind of great example because, you know, Blockbuster, perfect example, right? So basically Netflix took that and you were saying and kind of there's a disruption there. And now look at Netflix. Everybody has a Netflix account. <laughs> So, well, the Lord knows somebody who has one and uses their password. Yeah, that's true. We all share passwords. (laughs) But if you say there's a little over 100 million U.S. households, I think Mm -hmm. it's now up to over 110. They're well over a majority of that. Mm -hmm. That's how how to dream that big. I I don't know that Reed and Barry and the team wrote that down as being the size of the TAM they were going after. Yeah. But if, if you can see the future two or three years out and cascade that and cascade that and cascade that, a lot of these businesses take on a life of their own. And so that, and the number of companies who were very small and grew up to be large happens to blossom quite well here in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. And so we have some inherent advantages living here, investing in companies that are trying to do that. And some of that's the management teams have seen it before and can understand how to do it. Some of it's the, the venture capital dollars are local mm-hmm. and maybe there's other advantages as well. But trying to go and create that same ecosystem in Juneau, Alaska might be tougher, right? I want to switch gears a little bit because you are the founder and portfolio manager for Tornado Capital Management. Can you share with us a little bit about your company and what your focus is on? Mm-hmm. So it, this is taking that same, what's the right theme, try to find the right product, the right management team, the right business model, and applying that to the public market. And so I, I did the public market side of Crosslink 2005 through 2013, started Tornado inside of Crosslink. And I lifted it out in 2016. So depending on if you want to say when the firm started versus when the strategy started, but we're looking to identify 10 to 14 small companies that can grow up to be big and meaningful. It'd be awesome to go find Netflix, right? We haven't done that yet. Uh, we have a handful of uh, others that have done quite well. And as you might imagine, a cluster of a dozen small cap technology growth companies might be quite volatile. Mm -hmm. Here we are in March of 2022, and uh, a lot of stocks are down quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a hedged strategy. So we spend a lot of our time looking at shorts and trying to take a lot of that market risk out of the portfolio by finding small companies that are not going to be successful in that disruption side. And so one of the things that was missing in venture capital 20 years ago and is still missing today is that ability to to be short, Mm -hmm. uh, to be hedged. And I appreciate that aspect of the public markets where you can really put bigger bets on the things you think are going to happen because you don't have to worry as much about the larger market uh, contagions. Like you can spend a lot of time worrying about what it's going to happen to interest rates or oil prices or mm-hmm. any one of a number of other things. And your guess is as good or better than mine on a lot of those macro things. And I, I don't know how to make investment decisions uh, on the basis of the, those really big pieces. Back in college, when I was studying game theory and mm-hmm. economics, like reading The Economist was a lot of fun. But uh, my oldest kids are now teenagers. And it's been a lot of years since I've had two or three hours to sit down to, oh, yeah. <laughs> to read and pontificate about the, the global macro. So this brings me to a question. We know are, first, are you looking at any specific sector when you're looking at, or are you kind of opening it up and saying, okay, we just want you know the most exciting? Well, frequently we want things that are going to be exciting, not right. That currently are right since <laughs> that can let you get a better price. Uh, but no, we're technology small cap growth investors. So think single digit or billions of dollars of market cap. So five hundred million through five billion is sort of our, our sweet spot. And it, technology is broadly defined, right? Mm-hmm. I, I haven't gotten a paper ticket to fly on an airplane in a long time. Does that make them technology companies? Probably not. So that aspect of it's in the eye of the beholder is still somewhat nebulous, but trying to invest across 
software, infrastructure technologies, analytics, cloud connectivity. Those are some of our larger themes. Do you have any other interests to expand a little bit, not just focus on technology and any other sector that maybe that piqued your interest? Not particularly, since you're always trying to evolve. Right? Mm-hmm. So if you say my first job out of college was covering telecom equipment, it would be a really boring, boring life to still just be covering optical components. So continuing to try to learn new things is one of the joys of working in the markets broadly, whether mm-hmm. venture capital or public market. There's lots of things changing all the time, and some of them are how you personally react and deal with it. And some of it is how the market reacts and deals with new information. But that that excitement of having a new thing to have to chew on on a regular basis is part of the excitement of uh, all of this. And similarly, being an analyst focused on just that company or just that security and then moving to portfolio construction as a portfolio manager uh, and then into the entrepreneurial space of starting your own thing, each of those brings different types of learnings as well. I have to ask, you said you had uh, teenagers. Do they often tell you, Dad, look at this. This is so cool. This is new technology. I know kids these days know about new technology before adults do. So I'm curious if they've ever brought anything to you and said, you got to check this out. Um, They seem to think that some of the things I bring to them Mm -hmm. that are cool are kind of passe. (laughs) Uh, So there's more of that element. Uh, But a few of the things that, I mean, they're teenage boys, so Mm -hmm. GoPros are still really cool for them. But uh, (laughs) that that maybe was a stock from a number of years ago, not from the present, right? Uh, But uh, when Roblox went public early this year, that, that was an exciting time for them. Oh, good times. I'm sure they're they're very happy to, to know that you're in that room because I think boys specifically are very excited about technology. So, well, I wanted to dig in a little bit about your company. You have had it for, I want to say eight years. Is that about correct? I uh, started the firm in 2016. So yeah, we, we're just coming up on six years. So last time we spoke, you mentioned you have a very small team. Mm-hmm. Now, is it intentional to keep your team small or are or was it just the way that it worked operationally for you? Yeah, the, the joy of asset management is that you don't have to have a huge army of people. And so I prefer managing stocks and maybe I'm better at that aspect <laughs> than managing people, which uh, doesn't necessarily mean I'm good at either. But uh, the uh, the management of people aspects, yeah, I thought was to hire a small handful of people who are quite competent in getting themselves motivated on what they need to go and accomplish and be able to focus on the things I enjoy versus micromanaging folks. And having worked at firms over a thousand people and worked at firms where there was a lot of internal meeting. So I worked at Citadel 20 years ago and risk management was present. Uh, My understanding is it's even more present now. And so taking risks you think are appropriate is a big part of this job. But now having to take risks that you think are appropriate and explain them after the fact to somebody else, it, it takes some of the fun out of the job, right? And especially since those... So that was better than some others. But a lot of firms, they only come in and do that proctology exam on the mistakes that lose you money, not the mistakes that make money. And so that aspect of like how can how to be a good boss and say, hey, we got lucky on that one. Let's not do that again. <laughs> or the, hey, we got unlucky on that one, but you did it the right way mm-hmm. is is a hard, hard human behavioral thing to do mm-hmm. and something that's much easier to do in a small organization mm-hmm. uh, than via remote control. And so in starting out a small strategy, intentional on being a small firm as well. And so far, uh, that aspect's been working. Like the delegating responsibility to other people on uh, take the initiative on figure out what matters for that stock, what matters for that company. Like mm-hmm. go to the trade show, go and talk to the competitors, like read this research report, bring me along where you think it's appropriate. Let me ask silly questions and then tell me to go away. Like that aspect is useful on, I think, them building conviction, but also on me. Mm-hmm. And if I think back to like my best boss was a guy who I was probably not a great employee. I would show up in their office kind of unannounced. I had one boss who said that it was like I had opened my research paper to a random paragraph on a random page and just started spewing at them. And that it was really good stuff, but it would be great if I started at the beginning. And <laughs> that, But that sort of feedback loop 
of, hey, have you thought about this? Hey, have you worked on this? No, because of this. And then now I know what obstacles I have to go knock down. Now I know what I have to dig more and build my own conviction to share that with my colleagues is uh, an important part of getting stocks right or getting research process right. We can all have opinions, right. uh, but let's see if we can go back them up with something substantive with here's five customers who all made the switch from vendor A to vendor B. Why'd they do it? Like we should understand that. Oh shit, a couple of them went the other way. Like we should understand that too. Mm, yeah. So obviously having a small team, it's extremely important to find the right fit, the right candidate to join your team. So when you're searching for a new candidate, what are some hard skills are you looking for? And also interested to know what are some of the soft skills, which I don't think a lot of employers talk about, are you looking for? Uh, it, it's funny. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to work in the financial markets. Right? And so how to find that, that passion quotient that people have for being in this market and is is it because they see dollar signs? Right. Or is it because the, their parents told them that they had to go and chase dollar signs? So it's really that, that or is a it a, a, hey, like th- this stuff keeps them up at night. Like this is the, this is their hobby, right? Like, hey, I'd much rather be hitting golf balls uh, is maybe not, not us. Like that works for a lot of other people. Mm-hmm. Right. And so looking for folks who have that creativity of turning the next card. Mm-hmm. Uh, so frequently interviews are walking and talking about a, a stock and like, what else do we need to know? What else do like, what keeps you worried about this one? Why, why would we not have bought it yet? And what do we need to learn or solve for in order to build that conviction? And some of it's unknowable. Right? Like, will Netflix get good libraries of content? Will they green light the right shows? Like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Right? Uh, it, you need to see some evidence of that over time. Whereas other things, do customers prefer product A to product B? Like, that's something where you can take a lot of. Sh- it's a lot of brute force to get the answer to that question. So you may not have enough time to go after that. So it's trying to find that right balance of efficiency and fact. Right? Of like, hey, we can go diligence. These things, if we get the answers we're looking for, that's probably enough to be convicted on owning the stock. And because these are each in somewhat idiosyncratic small businesses, a lot of that falls on being creative. Like, oh, you read the Glassdoor reviews. Like, oh, like th- there was that LinkedIn profile. Oh, there's a disgruntled former who has taken an entire YouTube channel <laughs> to talk smack about the management team. Like, oh, the SEC filings. Like, you can go and build a very detailed Excel model that is wildly inaccurate. Like, how many hours should you do that for before you say, hey, this informed me of a new question and I need to go find the answers to that question, not put false precision into an Excel document. So that sort of understanding their own blind spots, understanding increasing Increasingly, as they become more senior, uh, my blind spots and being able to have some backbone to stand up and push back on that are all important attributes that are where on the resume do you look for any of that? Right. And so some of that's uh, overcoming adversity. uh, Some of that's hitting significant goals for me. and Maybe I'm old being promoted. So being liked and respected and valued by your teammates is being promoted internally is more valuable than uh, job shopping for a higher title elsewhere because I have to work with you. We own stocks. Some of the stocks that we own, we've owned for more than six years. If you're only going to be here for two, how does that help us on our investment process? We're going to have to backfill behind you and train somebody else as to why we're here and they're going to have to build the same conviction and that really I'd I'd rather have much longer professional relationships deeper professional relationships would you how much if you were to weight it like having the proper education versus you know because it sounds like a lot of this also has to do with intuition and having that self-conviction how would you weight it like 20% more so you know education versus having the gumption to go against the grain because you really believe in something? Or is it kind of all depends on what you're looking at and what you're looking into investment to? Uh, So being contrarian for the sake of being contrarian gets expensive very quickly. (laughs) Finding the right place to say that uh, that doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Like people are too pessimistic. People are too optimistic. And digging in there is that that's a hard thing to have. Right. And it's, maybe it's switching majors in college. Right. Right. Maybe it's moving from being in operations into being in finance inside of a large company because you want to get closer to numbers and find that that's not like, or maybe people have not stumbled. Maybe people have got lucky and know what they want to be when they're a small child and 
I uh, have always been an investigative reporter at heart and uh, are getting after that piece. So you know, it, it and for me, it's uh, I, I'm an auditory person. Like I read a lot, but I learn by talking with other people uh, as much as anything else. And so some of that's like, is this a person who ignites that where I, I feel like I'm smarter for having had that conversation or at least we can get smarter together. Mm, that's interesting. That's an interesting um, way to take it. And, you know, I think people always say you want to be the dumbest person in a room, right? Because you want to be able to learn from other people. So I want to ask, because last time we spoke, you mentioned you sit on the board at your kid's school. Mm-hmm. Is that something of importance to you? Because you've also are past president for CFA Society of San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious to see what you do outside of your normal day to day. Well, the, the CFA Society board came about at, through strange happenstance. So I talked a little bit about moving from being an analyst to being a portfolio manager to being an entrepreneur. And a, how, how do you keep learning as an analyst? How do you see different perspectives of portfolio management? Like, Sure, the folks at Franklin have a gazillion portfolio managers. Mm-hmm. And so you can learn from different pieces of that. But for the rest of us locally, like, there's very few mentors to have on that. And so I mentioned my aunt uh, was a member of the New York Society. She retired and she'd been a workaholic and CFA test grader. She retired. Uh, she passed away six months later. And it, so as I was thinking about where to go and uh, volunteer in town now that I had really tiny kids and going out and having a beer with a sales guy after work is maybe less going to fit into family lifestyle. I, I approached the CFA Society and said, geez, you had a really awesome speaker in Ken Olivier from Dodge and Cox coming in to talk about value versus growth. Like, How do we get more speakers like that? Well, I think I actually said, it, how do you get more speakers than that? <laughs> and Dan Brady, who is uh, head of the education committee, I was like, well, this is volunteer led. So who would you like to hear from and go get them? And so we end up having 15, 20 different portfolio managers come in and speak for over a turkey sandwich uh, in the CFA offices over the course of the next year and a half. And it was awesome. Like uh, Carl Kawacho was great. He's now chairman of Capital. Uh, the director of research from Matthews, who's now running C Bluff. Ted came in from Palo Alto. Like I had only one person tell me no when I made these asks. Like everybody wants to talk a little bit about what they're doing and they're curious and they want to give back. And Mm -hmm. I learned a boatload about myself, but I also learned a boatload about how other people go about Mm -hmm. managing in this business. And I thought that was awesome. And apparently CFA Society thought so too and put me on the board and then I ended up, yeah. Uh, but the good news is there's only one year after you're president of CFA Society San Francisco that you get to be on the board since there's one year of being past president and then you're off into the wherever and my kids are old enough that, uh, yeah, I've been involved in a couple of other nonprofits, uh, mainly around kids and education in part because I have kids and I believe in education, but also in that kind of learning different skills, learning different modes, like joining a nonprofit board. I broke down some of the inhibitions on trying to go out and be an entrepreneur and raise money. Wow. Since re- asking people for money is hard. How do you develop that skill? Well, asking people for money for something that's not you, like, hey, here's this really good cause. I'm giving money to it. You should give money to it too. Hey, wait, like I can do this. Hey, I have this business I'm starting. (laughs) I'm putting all of my livelihood behind it. You should too. Isn't as far of a step removed from that. And so I I learned some things uh, in each of these instances that's been fun and mind expanding, but it's also uh, been somewhat purposeful on uh, what is it that I want to go and step into next? And how can I go and develop those skills while maybe still using training wheels? Oh, that's amazing to hear how you essentially, we got to the flip side. You're the one asking for money and well, having learned that and having gone through that, you know, through your nonprofit work, have you kind of looked at those entrepreneurs coming to you asking, you know, for money, you kind of created a soft spot for them, or do you think of them differently? Or do you ask, you suddenly asking questions differently? Like what changed? Oh, uh, I mean, the empathy for the people on the other side of the table yeah. is <laughs> I'm sure. is real, right? Like <laughs> it, This week, I just got done with my first in-person conferences in the tech world, right? Yeah. So there were a couple TMT conferences, uh, broker led here in town. And there's a lot of people who don't, who, who needed to tell the management teams how to run their business. Despite the management team having 30 years of experience and them being maybe 
two years out of school, three years out of school. And you're like, yeah, me. Harkening back to those early days of venture capital, like, why is this person even talking to me? It's like, because it matters to them that their employee's mm-hmm. stock is valuable, that their own stock, that they have a currency by which to go and build a new factory or make an acquisition or hire a new engineering team. Like, these are the reasons why they're here. It's not to listen to, you, you pat yourself on the back. And I hope I learned that lesson at an early age. Don't have to relearn it too, too often. But yeah, there's a certain uh, putting yourself out there is hard. And so kudos to the people who do. Um, you mentioned that some of your entrepreneurs are younger. Did you, do you find that now they are younger and younger than they were, say, 10, 20 years or 15 years ago? I, well, I'm older and older. So everybody feels younger. <laughs> I guess so. I uh, no, not particularly. Uh, like there've always been a barbell of folks. I don't know if it's a normal distribution or not. It kind of depends on what category, what industry you're in. No, like it, certainly a, one metamorphosis in the CFA group. Like I, I was fortunate to be aware of it in college and took my first CFA exam two weeks after my finals, my senior year. Uh, which was good because I failed level two twice. And so it took me a little longer to get through the three exams. And I think that was really uncommon in the 90s, not not failing the exams, but taking level one that early. And I think that's become more common. Yeah. Uh, and so the kind of awareness of the industry, awareness of the CFA charter, but also just the financial analysis as a as a job, as a career, mm-hmm. uh, has, has certainly moved earlier. So people on, I don't even want to say people on my side of the table are younger because, but... Yeah, they, I'm not sure I'd make a hard and fast statement about that. <laughs> well, it's even a, before I let you go, I ask this to everybody. I want to know who inspires you and why. Yeah, I, I try to draw it from a lot of different places. Like you know, I've got a stack of books here behind me, but uh, it, it's funny as to the the pieces that you can draw from each of them. And the best book for me on understanding financial markets is ironically one from 100 years ago. Oh, really? Uh, at reminiscence of a stock operator. Uh, it, because it turns out the markets are made up by humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have lots of strengths and weaknesses and the, our emotional and all of that aspect. And so I, I have some accounting books and those are useful really? in understanding SEC docs. But the human behavioral piece and not to give too much away about the book and reminiscence of a stock operator, but it does not end well for the hero uh, in all of that. And so folks who have found that good balance of understanding themselves and being good back to communities that, that matter to them. And there's a lot of those people. So uh, you've had a couple of good people predating me on your podcasts uh, where Elsie Fletcher was was president right after me. Uh, and she and I did some big things with the society working together. Not somebody I ever would have met outside of doing that. And wow. she's fabulous. Yes. And uh, you had Matt O'Hara on there as well. Like, yeah. I was the littlest, tiniest company guy on the board and he was the biggest company guy on the board and yet we still uh, see each other multiple times per year, many years after being involved in that. And so finding inspiration in many different walks of life. I have some of that around coaching kids sports or around people I worked with straight out of college or with uh, friends of mine from elementary school. And so finding those threads that make a difference to you and can give you some sort of cushion (laughs) when life's not necessarily going right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also uh, give you some humility when maybe you think life's too easy is a great, great group of people. That's fantastic. The people that you name are absolutely up there. They're so inspiring within themselves. So I have to agree with you there. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. And I really can't wait to see where you'll be in the next couple of years. You and me both. You and me both. (laughs) Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the CFA Society San Francisco podcast. We hope you enjoyed the engaging discussion. Please stay tuned for more episodes of this podcast featured every fourth Tuesday in our weekly newsletters and through the CFA Society San Francisco podcast channel available through most major podcast apps.